this is the experience that most people have. They'll eat a high fat diet, they'll have one banana, and then they'll check their blood glucose two hours later and they'll be like, look, look, Dr. Ben, look, my blood glucose is high. Can't you see that? I got a 174. That damn banana. I told you, every time I eat a banana, my blood glucose goes high. Potatoes are bad for me. Like every single time I eat that, my blood glucose goes high. I just had one bowl of rice. Are you kidding me? And now my glucose is high? That doesn't make any sense. So this fuels this anti-carbohydrate you know, sentiment that carbohydrates equal sugar. Sugar equals high blood sugar. Sugar equals diabetes. Don't eat carbohydrates. Well, I'm not going to eat potatoes. I'm not going to eat bananas. I'm not going to eat mangoes. I'm going to avoid fruits. I'm only going to eat berries because that's all I can eat. And I'm going to avoid all these other carbohydrate rich, you name it. And then they eat more eggs, more bacon, more fish, more fat rich foods, more cheese. And as a result of that, they end up again, fueling the problem, but then they play the carbohydrate avoidance game so that they can basically never experience a high blood glucose. So they're basically doing a fuel switch. They're saying, if I'm gonna operate on fat as my primary fuel source, and I'm just gonna minimize or you know dramatically reduce the amount of carbohydrate that's in my mouth, then my blood glucose will remain stable and everything will be fine. Just because your glucose is controlled and your glucose might be stable does not mean that the biology of your liver and muscle is in a healthy state. And what I mean by that is that when you're eating a high fat diet and you're playing the carbohydrate avoidance game, you can get good blood glucose values, which will happen on a plant-based ketogenic diet. But the minute you try and eat something carbohydrate rich, whether it's a potato or whether it's a fruit, your blood glucose is likely to go through the roof. Now, why would that be? Well, the reason is because your liver and muscle are still operating in that insulin resistant state. So that was Cyrus Kambada, and he is today's guest on the Alter Your Health podcast. This is your source of information and inspiration to promote the holistic transformation of your health and the health of our planet. My name is Dr. Benjamin Alter. I'm the host of this podcast. I'm also a licensed naturopathic physician, and I practice holistic lifestyle medicine all over the world. You can find out more and get on the schedule for a complimentary 15-minute exploratory consultation at www.alter.health. Learn how we can support you in reversing your symptoms and living your best life with the help of a whole food plant-based diet, as well as mind-body medicine, mind-body empowerment, because we know how important your mind is, your state of mind, your mindset in this whole equation of health and well-being. So on today's episode, we've got Cyrus Kambada, Dr. Cyrus Kambada, PhD, is the co-founder of Mastering Diabetes, the co-host of the Mastering Diabetes audio experience podcast and the co-author of Mastering Diabetes, the book, which if, by the way, if you are listening to this podcast, then that means that the book is officially launched and you can get your hands on a copy at Amazon. Uh, so in this conversation, in this episode, we talk about Mastering Diabetes. We, we get a little deeper into the science of reversing insulin resistance, which lies at the root of pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, type 1.5 diabetes, and type 1 diabetes, and so many other chronic conditions that we're faced with today, including cancer and heart disease, metabolic syndrome, etc. So if you're wondering who the other co-author, co-host, co-founder is with Cyrus, that would be Robbie Barbero, past guest on the Alter Your Health podcast, episode number 68. Uh, in this episode, we might dig a little deeper than we may be covered in the science with Robbie. Uh, we kind of take it a step deeper, a step further, because I think I really asked some good questions. I, I might give myself a pat on the back here. And Cyrus really, really, truly did provide some exquisite answers to the tough questions that I had for him. Uh, we talk about all things carbohydrate, all things fatty acids, lipid, insulin resistance, fructose, glucose, Krebs cycle, metabolism. We geek out a little bit. 
And it's always fun to geek out with a fellow carbohydrate lover like Cyrus. So like I said, Dr. Cyrus, full of wisdom, full of knowledge, full of information. If, you've, if you are living with type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes or 1.5 or type 1 diabetes, you're definitely going to want to go over to masteringdiabetes.org to learn more about how these guys can support you and also give them a follow at Mastering Diabetes on Instagram and Facebook. And if you're not living with type 2 diabetes or maybe you're living with other chronic conditions, other chronic ailments, or maybe you're just wanting to take your health to the next level in whatever way that means for you, come on into our Facebook group here at Alter Health. It's called Plant-Based and Stress-Free. You can find us at facebook.com slash groups slash Alter Health. That's where you find us. Uh, in that group, we run all sorts of free events, free informational stuff, free challenges. It's a lot of fun. You'll receive the support from me, from Dr. Susanna Alter, and from the whole community of plant-based and stress-free livers. So with that said, before we dive in, one last announcement. I am so grateful for your presence, your ears, your open heart, your open mind in you know being on the other end of this podcast. I do appreciate your time, and I'd be so grateful if you would leave a comment, leave a rating, write a review, send this episode or any other off to a friend, a loved one, maybe someone who is struggling with their diet, their health, their chronic condition or symptom. With that said, let's all put our feet on the ground, take a breath, let it go, and enjoy this wonderful conversation with our guest, Cyrus Kambada. If you want to do it without my shirt on, I can do it. <laughs> You're good. You're good. It does take a lot of effort for me to put a shirt on, so I'm, I'm glad you appreciate that. Yes. So thank you for wearing the tank top, muscles engaged. Uh, <laughs> Cyrus, welcome to the Alter Your Health podcast. So happy to have you on. Thanks so much for having me here today. I appreciate it. This is, uh, it's always good to uh, get the word out and I uh, appreciate the opportunity. You guys at Mastering Diabetes are phenomenally excellent at getting the word out. So, uh, you know, I'm sitting over here taking notes about words and how to get them out. You guys are awesome. No, I appreciate that. Actually, I feel like in this game of, you know, there's a lot of people who have a message they want to tell the world. And, you know, you can tell it through Google or through Instagram or YouTube or all of the above. And like, we, we just do our best. And, uh, you know, I appreciate everything that you have to say. Yeah, there's a level, there, there's certainly a consistency. I mean, can't argue with the science, right? We'll get into that. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's just this consistency, clarity, concise, simplicity. You know, it's on point. It's on point. Um, so... Uh, let's see, where do we start? I want to go back a little bit just because I don't know you. I had Robbie on, like I was saying about a year ago, I think a little over a year ago now. And, That's right. um, I know his story a little bit, but let's hear your story. You're, I know you're also a type one diabetic. Let's uh, hear about when that came to be noticed and your kind of journey and managing it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I was diagnosed. I grew up as a, a pretty happy-go-lucky guy. Um, I've always been normal weight, um, played sports all throughout my childhood, soccer, baseball, running, biking, hiking, swimming, you name it, whatever, whatever there was to do, I would try it. Uh, by the time I got to college, uh, I was playing soccer all the time. I was lifting weights, 22 years old, trying to graduate from my you know, senior year. And uh, all of a sudden, I started to feel super thirsty, and I was very low energy. I was going to the bathroom without exaggeration, 17, 18, 19, 20 times a day. Uh, and I, I felt like something was terribly wrong with me, and I just did not know. I, I kind of didn't want to admit it at first. And then after a couple of days of this, I was like, oh, this, is, this doesn't feel right. So I picked up the phone, I called my sister, and she's a doctor of osteopathy. And I said, I said hey, Shanaz, what is going on with me? I, I'm thirsty all the time. Uh, I'm going to the bathroom all the time and I have no energy. And she started crying immediately. She was like, Cyrus, drop everything you're doing. Go straight to the health center. You have type one diabetes. And she's brilliant. She, she sniffed it out in like five seconds. 
And I was like, Shanaz, I don't have type one diabetes. Come on, you got, don't be ridiculous. Because at that time, I, I didn't know anything about health, biology, human biology, that diabetes for sure. All I knew was that diabetes had something to do with old people and cake. So I literally was like, I was like in my head, I'm like, no, I'm not old. I, I don't eat cake. What's going on? So I go to the hospital. Or sorry, I go to the health center. They check my blood glucose. I'm over 600. Now, your blood glucose is supposed to be basically between 70 and 130, 70 and 140 on a daily basis. And so mine was, you know, about six times higher than it was supposed to be. And so uh, they check me to the hospital, go to the hospital. They give me an IV of saline on one arm. They gave me an IV of insulin on the other arm. And they bring my blood glucose down over the course of 24 hours. So while I'm in the hospital, they, they tell me, they say, listen, we're going to piece together your health history to try and figure out why this is happening to you. And they helped me piece together the fact that I actually had three autoimmune conditions. So the first one is Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. The second one uh, is alopecia universalis, which is basically a scientific way of saying no hair. I got no hair, no eyebrows, no eyelashes, no ear hair, nose hair. I can't grow a beard to save my life. Um, and then the third one was type 1 diabetes. And the kicker was that all three of these set in within six months of each other. And so I went from just being like, you know, a quote unquote normal guy to all of a sudden, not one, not two, but three autoimmune conditions. And um, I was pretty nervous because I didn't know why this was happening. And to make matters worse, the doctors said to me, they said, Cyrus, we've never seen anybody with this combination of autoimmune conditions before. You have what's called a polyglandular autoimmune syndrome. Don't really know that much about it. Can we talk about you at our next team huddle? And I was like, oh, cool. So I'm that like weird freak guy that shows up with, you know, a random set of symptoms as if I was on house MD. Hmm. And so they told me, they said, listen, we, we know how to treat type one diabetes. We can teach you how to eat properly, but other you know, alopecia, we can't treat and Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. You're just going to have to take a pill every day. That's it. You're going to have to take a thyroid hormone supplement and that's it. So I was like, okay, I mean, I guess that's what I have to do. So I get discharged from the hospital within 24 hours with two different types of insulin, a basal insulin, a bolus insulin, a blood glucose meter, test strips, insulin syringes, a carbohydrate counting guide, and a bracelet that says, I'm a life alert patient. If I'm passed out on the sidewalk, call 911. And so I leave the hospital and I was like, what the heck just happened to me? You've got to be kidding me. So I tried to get my life together. And I tried to continue living like a normal college guy with six months to go before I graduated. <clears throat> and it, I mean, my blood glucose was a complete disaster. And so I started to take nutrition a little bit more seriously. So I listened to the doctors. They said low carbohydrate diet because that's the advice that doctors give to people with all forms of diabetes. And the, the thought process is simple. I say, if you eat carbohydrate rich foods, whether it's cookies, and cereals and pastas and breads and chips, like the refined versions, or if it's fruits and potatoes or beans or whole grains. It doesn't matter what type of carbohydrate you eat, but anytime you eat carbohydrates, your, your blood glucose will go up. As a result of that, you're gonna need more insulin, and as a result of that, your life's gonna become more difficult. So our recommendation is minimize your carbohydrate intake because if you do, then your life will become simpler and you can control your blood glucose easier. So I said, cool, let's do it. So I went to the grocery store and I started stocking up on all these low carbohydrate foods, salmon, turkey breasts, um, peanut butter, milk, eggs, cheese. I was trying to keep it, you know, quote unquote, lean meats to the best of my ability. And then I was minimizing pasta, minimizing bread, minimizing rice, minimizing fruits, potatoes, you name it. So I did this for a year and I thought, okay, this is supposed to make me healthier. This is supposed to help me control my blood glucose, but my Lord. My glucose was a freaking disaster. So I wish I had like recorded what my blood glucose was doing at that time, but I didn't really do anything. But my blood glucose on a daily basis was, was all over the place. I would go high, low, high, low, high, low, multiple times a day. Again, blood glucose is supposed to be between 70 and 130 on a daily basis. And my glucose would range from like 50 to 320, 50 to 350 on a daily basis. And to make matters worse, my insulin use was going up. And my energy levels were going way down. Like I thought I didn't have very much energy when I first got diagnosed and then it got worse. And the kicker for me was that my muscles started to hurt. 
And I've been an active dude ever since I was a little boy. And if you compromise my mobility, I get mad. So as soon as playing soccer became difficult, as soon as going to the gym became difficult, I was like, no, 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 no. This is not happening. I'm a 22 year old guy. I refuse. I absolutely refuse to live in a body that I can't use. So I started looking for information. One thing led to another and I got introduced to this idea of being a plant-based eater. This isn't back in 2003 when like plant-based was not cool. Vegetarian was not cool. Vegan was not cool at all. There were very few people even talking about it at that time. But the, um, you know, I got introduced for whatever reason to this idea of being a, you know, a vegan or a, a plant-based eater. So I said, cool, if it's going to help me out, I'll do whatever. So under the guidance of a, of a guy named Dr. Doug Graham, who is a, he, he teaches people how to adopt a raw food diet. He basically took me under his wing and he was confident about helping somebody with type one diabetes. And that was refreshing because nobody else I had met had confidence in dealing with a type one. It's like people with type one diabetes are considered like the redheaded stepchild of the sort of chronic disease community. And, um, you know, a lot of people are sort of like, oh, like, I, don't, I don't understand type one. I'm, I'm not going to touch type one. No offense, gingers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We love you, gingers. Yeah. <laughs> we love you guys. So, so here I am uh, talking to a guy who actually does have confidence. So he takes me under his wing at a retreat over the course of seven days. He teaches me how to throw away this like anti-carbohydrate, what he refers to as anti-carbohydrate propaganda. He's like, it's not true. From a biological perspective, it doesn't really make that much sense. Let me show you. So we did like a seven-day experiment in my body, and he showed me how I can you know, eat tremendous amounts of potatoes, sorry, not potatoes, tre tre tremendous amounts of fruit you know, as like the starting point. So I was eating bananas, papayas, mangoes, oranges, um, you know, persimmons, you name it. And uh, so my carbohydrate intake went from like 100 grams a day all the way up to 600 grams a day. And I was expecting that my insulin use would also go way higher because that's the story I had been told. That's the rhetoric in the diabetes community. My, my carbohydrate intake six tupled and my insulin use came down by 40%. So I was basically eating six times as much carbohydrate for 40% less insulin. And I was like, this is fascinating. This is really cool. My glucose was more controllable. My insulin use was down. My energy levels went up. I was more hydrated and I could, I could feel it in my body. I could start moving my body again and start playing sports again and running. And I was just like, wow, this is incredible. So long story short, I was so fascinated by what I had experienced in my own body that I put myself back to graduate school to go get a PhD in nutritional biochemistry. So while I was there, I, I, was, I was studying for five years to literally answer one question. And that one question was, am I a freak of nature? Right? Is what I experienced a really cool end of one experiment? Or is what I experienced something that's actually applicable to other people? And so I started reading a lot of research and started experimenting in uh, laboratory animals and was able to really delve into this idea of like, what causes diabetes and what causes blood glucose fluctuations? And how do you reverse, you know, how do you, how do you normalize blood glucose? And in the process, I was able to uncover literally 100 years of research since the 1920s that have not only explained what happened in me, but had actually explains why <clears throat> a plant-based diet, a low-fat plant-based whole food diet, is one of the most, is, is the most powerful solution to insulin resistance and diabetes that the world has ever seen before. Mm -hmm. So that's when the light bulb turned on and I was like, wait a minute, there's something really important here. Let's try and teach this to the world. Awesome. Awesome. I want to go back and kind of, you know, dig in a little bit. And I've, you sure. know, the, first of all, the, the fact that you've got this trifecta or you had this trifecta of autoimmune conditions and you were the, the focus of the, the doctor huddle and, um, what was going on in your life at that time? What, like, what do you think really, you know, there, I know there's a lot of theories about autoimmunity and whatnot. What do you think and what do you feel flip the switch for you in terms of kind of, you know, bringing these disease manifestations to the surface? That's a, that's a really good question. I think there's a combination of things. Number one, uh, I wasn't really paying attention to what I was eating. Okay. So the, the quality of the food that I was eating was not 
a top priority for me because I was in college and I was just eating at the cafeteria. And so it could be like, I went on to learn later in life that the quality of the food that you eat is a strong determinant in, you know, any disease process that may unfold in your body and chronic disease in general. And there's a pretty strong connection between cow's milk protein and type one diabetes. There's a strong yeah. association between uh, there's a there's a bacteria found in meat and um, dairy products called MAP Mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis. Uh, don't remember that, but it's basically a bacteria. It has a very strong connection to uh, autoimmunity and to type one diabetes. And so it could be that at the time I was just exposed to pathogens inside of the food that I was eating that increased my risk for type one diabetes. And I was uh, just uh, curious about these pathogens because a lot of people are like, oh, but well, you know, what about the grass fed? What about the hormone free this, that? Do you know mm -hmm. if these pathogens are associated with factory farmed animals or just animals across the board? Is there? Okay. So the, uh, the cow's milk protein, it's basically a, a, the protein that's found in cow's milk that is associated with an increased risk for type one diabetes does not go away when the animal is grass fed or when an animal is taken care of. It's part, it's literally part of the, uh, it's, it's a, it's kind an of animal. like the, the microbiome of the cow, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's part of the milk, right? Um, but the mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis, MAP is a bacteria that's found in animals in, in cows in domesticated farms that are actually suffering from a condition called Jones disease. And so a very small number of these cows actually have Jones disease. They poop, um, their poop, their fecal material has the MAP bacteria in it. It spreads to other cows just because they're sort of in the vicinity. And then it gets on the gloves and the boots of the industrial workers. When they're slaughtering the cows, it gets in the food and then it gets to your grocery store. So uh, the answer is yes. If you have a healthy cow that does not suffer from chronic disease, does not have Jones disease, then the MAP bacteria is likely to not be there. So I would say, uh, yes and no, you know, obviously grass fed meat is going to be healthier than non grass fed meat, but I still don't think that that's like a panacea. And I yeah. certainly wouldn't recommend people to be eating grass fed meat myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, uh, super cool that you ha ha felt this inspiration to go back to school, get this PhD, support yourself in understanding more deeply what's going on For sure. and supporting thousands of people by empowering them with this information. Um, so getting into the science a little bit, you know, we did, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with it all and we did get into it quite a bit with Robbie, but, you know, just refresh our memories in terms of, okay, I've got high blood sugar. I should stay away from sugar or carbohydrates, right? Like that's what doctors said, but give us the, the science in the simplest forms of mm -hmm. why that's not true. You know, I always say that um, a low carb diet is a great way to manage diabetes, but a low fat, which means high carb diet is a great way to reverse diabetes. So how does that work though? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and this is actually the crux of the matter because there's a lot of people who are living with you know, any form of diabetes or people who are at risk for diabetes because they have a family member with it. And the, you, if you walk around to 100 people on the street and you say the word, you just walk up to them and you say diabetes. You say, tell me the first word that comes to your head, diabetes. I, I kid you not, 100% of them, maybe not 100, 90% of them will say sugar, right? Diabetes, sugar, diabetes, sugar. So some people might say diabetes, obesity, diabetes, overweight, something like that. Cookies, cake. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Cookies, uh, you know, refined carbohydrates or carbs, you know, you might hear that all the time. Um, and the, the truth is that, yes, um, refined sugar and refined carbohydrates have been documented in the medical literature to increase your risk for this thing called insulin resistance and increase your risk for the development of type 2 diabetes. There's no question about that. Um, and as a result of that, People have gone on to assume, okay, well, you know, sugar is a thing that comes from carbohydrate. Therefore, all carbohydrates are bad for me. So in, in, the, in the world of like food, you have one class of molecule that's called carbohydrate. Okay. You have another class called protein and another class called fatty acids or fat. Okay. 
These are basically what are called three macronutrients, and that's where you derive energy. So that's where your body actually converts those into ATP and then uses that for useful energy to actually operate your brain, your heart, your lungs, your liver, your kidney, you name it. So um, unfortunately, in the, in the world today, the term carbohydrate has become very confusing. And it's become like oversimplified and people fear eating carbohydrates. And so the term carbohydrate is, uh, refers to a class of molecule that, is, um, that you can derive energy off of, that you can burn and oxidize for energy, but it comes from many different types of foods. So you can get it in, you know, at the grocery store when you buy packaged and processed pastries, cookies, waffles, chips, crackers, soda. Okay, it's all over the place in these like refined and packaged products. It's also uh, carbohydrate rich foods include in the natural world fruits, starchy vegetables that grow on the ground like potatoes and yams and uh, turnips and parsnips and rutabaga and squash. And then you can also get it from beans, lentils and peas and you can also get it from whole grains like quinoa or spelt or buckwheat. Okay, so you have basically two different completely different types of carbohydrate molecule, the refined carbohydrates as well as the whole carbohydrates. And unfortunately, both of them have been lumped into this thing called carbs. And as a result of that, you know, the low carb community and, you know, starting with Atkins and moving all the way through paleo and ketogenic diets now, people have been told carbs are bad for you. Eat a low carb diet, eat a no carb diet. Don't eat carbs, 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 carbs are bad for you. Carbs will make you fat. Carbs will increase your cholesterol. Uh, carbs will spike your insulin use. And so there's this like fear that people have of eating anything that's carbohydrate rich. Now, if that conversation was just confined to the refined carbohydrates, I would have zero problem with it. The problem is that that conversation does not only include those refined carbohydrates. It also includes the, the whole carbohydrates that you know, nature provides for you. But Cyrus... But Cyrus, when I eat the whole carbohydrate, it turns into sugar, right? Like it's all turns into the same thing in my body, right? Like, so what difference does it make? So what's the difference? Okay, so let's go backwards. The term sugar, I, I do not like the term sugar because uh, technically speaking, you can use the word sugar to sort of talk about very specific molecules in the biological world. But the term sugar is a term that we use to describe a white crystalline substance that you get from a packet that we know, we know without question is associated with chronic disease. Refined sugar increases your risk for many chronic diseases, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, uh, diabetes. And so we're using the same word to describe a refined substance that causes chronic disease as well as the thing that you get from a potato. And it's a, it's a misnomer. So rather than using the word sugar, I'm going to use the word glucose because glucose is actually a fuel. It's, it's, a, it's a molecule that circulates in your blood. It's a molecule that your brain operates of 99.99% of your life. And it's a fuel for all tissues in your body. So when you eat carbohydrate rich food from the whole, uh, whole carbohydrate rich food, fruits, starchy vegetables, legumes, and whole grains, those molecules are broken down into glucose, and they're also broken down into fructose as well. Those are the two predominant um, monosaccharide molecules that result. And your liver, your muscles, your adipose tissue, your brain have the ability to use glucose and fructose for energy. And that's and when they do it, and they're doing it in um, their their when tissues are exposed to whole foods that are also packed with vitamins and minerals and fiber and water and antioxidants and phytochemicals, then tissues are able to use that glucose and fructose for energy. When you eat a refined carbohydrate, the refined carbohydrate doesn't have vitamins, minerals, fiber, water, antioxidants, and phytochemicals in nearly the proportions that the whole food did. And as a result of that, you end up with just like giant surges of glucose and giant surges of fructose that can cause inflammation and start to damage tissues because too much comes in too quickly. So if we take a step backwards here, and now that we understand that you know whole carbohydrates and refined carbohydrates act fundamentally, fundamentally different inside of the human body, 
Uh, we cannot even talk about them in the sort of same way. Um, the real crux of this argument when it comes to like diabetes and insulin resistance is, is understanding how another class of molecule called lipid or fatty acids actually interact with carbohydrates because they, they don't act in isolation. Yeah. Well, I always, you know, like to remind people, all right, who is actually going and spoonfulling sugar into their mouth? Who's eating white flour? Who's, who's eating these refined carbohydrates in isolation? They're usually in the form of a cake or a cupcake with trans fats and saturated fats and wash, you know, sipping down the Coke that's washing down the French fries that go along with the cheeseburger you know, it's, it's, um, you know, so yeah, there's this whole kind of whole, there's a symphony of diet. multiple different types of molecules yeah. together. Absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right. You're not yeah. sitting there eating any one isolated nutrient. You're, you're eating it as a whole. So what the average American does is eats the, you know, the standard American diet, standard American diet is about 40% fat, about 40% carbohydrate, about 20% protein. And, um, <clears throat> When you eat a diet that is high in medium to high in fat, okay? When I say medium to high in fat, I mean, you know, anything greater than about 15%, 15 to 20% of your total calories as fat. So let's, you know, just for classification, if we say something from like 20% to 40% would be considered medium fat, and then 40% to, to 80% would be considered high fat. Well, I'll, okay. I'll pause you right there. And that's just really interesting because if we go back to, you know, the low fat diet of the nineties or whatever, eighties, that was like 25%, if I remember correctly, or maybe you've got better remember, rem you know, memory on the matter. Yeah. So, uh, when people were told to when public health recommendations were to eat a low fat diet. Yeah, low fat. People made the assumption, right, low fat. People made the assumption that Americans actually abided by that and actually went low fat. Yeah. If you take a look at the epidemiological research, you'll see that uh, people went from eating something like 37% of their diet in fat to 36% of their diet, like plus or minus 1%. I mean, it was, it was such an insignificant change that it wasn't even worth talking about. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, and so uh, in addition to that, even though the fat – total fat content in the diet didn't actually change for like, you know, general America, the amount of refined sugar that went into your diet skyrocketed, it went up way up. So yeah. product manufacturers were making these quote unquote low fat cookies. And all they were doing is basically finding a way to reduce the fat in content. And they were adding refined sugar and were adding high fructose corn syrup. So America never did a low fat diet, even though people might want to believe that it actually happened. Okay. So, um, Okay, eating a, a, a medium fat diet or a high fat diet can cause many issues. Now, uh, when you eat a diet that's, uh, that's either medium or high in fat, what happens is that the, the fatty acid molecules, the, the, the triglyceride gets into your mouth, goes down into your digestive system. The fatty acids are then pulled into your blood and they circulate in your blood and they have access to your adipose tissue as well as your fat tissue and your liver tissue. Now, if 100% if of the fat that you ate in your diet went into your adipose tissue, you, or your fat tissue, then everything would be fine. That literally would not be a problem. Okay, your fat tissue is a safe place to store fatty acids. It's a tissue that's specifically designed to uptake fatty acids when present, to hold on to those fatty acids for a long period of time, and then to get rid of them when the time is right. But part of the problem starts when your your adipose tissue takes up some of the fatty acids from your diet. But then, in addition to that, there's spillover, and some of those fatty acids get into your muscle, and some of them get into your liver. And when your liver and muscle end up accumulating fatty acids. Um, it's okay at the beginning, but then it can become a pathological problem, a disease-causing problem over the course of time. Your liver and muscle, if you take a look at the actual architecture of the, the cells, what you'll find is that they do have an ability to store small amounts of uh, fatty acids as triglycerides. So they pull in a fatty acid and they rebuild a tri triglyceride molecule. They can store small amounts inside of a lipid droplet, inside of cells in your liver and in your muscle. But when you're eating a medium or high fat diet and you eat, you know, for breakfast and for lunch and for dinner, and then you have some sausage and you have some bacon, then you have some more eggs, then you have some more milk and more cheese and more avocados and nuts and seeds. Then over the course of time, the amount of fatty acids that are present in your blood end up overwhelming the uh, storage capacity of your liver and muscle. So your liver and muscle end up over accumulating fatty acids. 
and they end up initiating this self-protective mechanism to try and block more energy from coming in. So your liver and muscle basically are like, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Let's stop this stuff from coming in because again, there's too much that's been over accumulating over the course of time. So what they would like to do is basically block fat, fatty acids from coming in, but they can't do it because there's very weak cellular mechanisms to actually block fatty acids from coming in. So in order to do that, to, to block more energy, they block something else. And the other thing that they block is this thing called insulin. Because insulin is a very powerful, extremely powerful signal. And insulin has thousands of effects in your body. The primary effect of insulin is to get glucose, to signal to tissues, to knock on the door of a tissue and say, hey, knock, knock, there's some glucose in the blood, would you like to take it up? And so what your cells and your muscle and liver do is they say, oh, okay, we can't really block these fatty acids from coming in, but if we tell insulin that we're not interested, the next time insulin comes knocking, we can tell them to go away. So you're eating a high fat diet. You've accumulated excess fatty acids inside of your liver and muscle. Then you decide to go eat a banana or you decide to eat a bowl of rice. And what happens is that the carbohydrate energy from the banana, from the bowl of rice, ends up getting broken down into glucose. The glucose is circulating through your blood. Insulin comes knocking on the door. Hey, liver. Hey, muscle. You want this glucose? There's glucose in the blood. Do you want to take it up? And the liver and muscle respond by saying, sorry, can't take it right now. I'm not talking to you. We're closed for business. I got to get rid of this lipid droplet first. Let me take care of this bad boy. Then I can take that glucose up. So the insulin's like, well, darn it. That didn't work. So it's trapped in your blood. And the glucose is like, well, darn it. That didn't work. And the glucose gets trapped in your blood. So this state is referred to as insulin resistance. Okay, The liver and the muscle are resistant to insulin's signal such that insulin becomes less effective, which means one of two things happen. Either your, your pancreas starts to make more insulin to sort of overpower this process. Or if you already have diabetes, then you have to just inject more insulin in order to make your you know, glucose get into your liver and muscle. So what this does is it basically creates a traffic jam for glucose. And glucose ends up getting pooled in your blood. Now, this is the experience that most people have. They'll eat a high-fat diet, they'll have one banana, and then they'll check their blood glucose two hours later, and they'll be like, look, Look, Dr. Ben, look, my blood glucose is high. Can't you see that? I got a 174. That damn banana. That yep. damn banana. I told you, every time I eat a banana, my blood glucose goes high. Potatoes are bad for me. Like every single time I eat that, my blood glucose goes high. I just had one bowl of rice. Are you kidding me? And now my glucose is high? That doesn't make any sense. So they always sort of like, you know, it's not their fault, but the, their experience is that eat carbohydrate-rich food, get high blood glucose. So what would and you do? That's, that's, that's confirmed by the conventional world of uh, thinking around managing diabetes nutritionally. Exactly right. Like you started a conversation in your story. Yeah. Right. So this fuels this carbohydrate, this anti-carbohydrate you know, sentiment that carbohydrates equal sugar. Sugar equals high blood sugar. Sugar equals diabetes. Don't eat carbohydrates, right? So people operate in this, this, this uh, scenario for many years at a time. And so what they do is they avoid eating carbohydrates. So they go, okay, great. Well, I'm not going to eat potatoes. I'm not going to eat bananas. I'm not going to eat mangoes. I'm going to avoid fruits. I'm only going to eat berries because that's all I can eat. And I'm going to avoid all these other carbohydrate rich, you name it. And then they eat more eggs, more bacon, more fish, more, uh, more fat rich foods, more cheese. And as a result of that, they end up, again, fueling the problem, but then they play the carbohydrate avoidance game so that they can basically never experience a high blood glucose, right? So they're basically doing a fuel switch. They're saying, if I'm going to operate on fat as my primary fuel source, and I'm just going to minimize or you know, dramatically reduce the amount of carbohydrate that's in my mouth, then my blood glucose will remain stable and everything will be fine. Yeah. So great way, like, you know, like I kind of simplify Great way to manage your blood sugar, low, low carb diet, yes. horrible way to reverse diabetes, the underlying cause insulin resistance. But ta you know, this is maybe a good segue into what are the consequences of using this alternative fuel source, otherwise known as ketosis, that is still, I can't believe it. It's still so trendy. Um, you know, what 
are from your nutritional biochemistry understanding, mm -hmm. you know, why, because let's, let's face it. I think people generally would prefer to focus on the bacon rather than the pot sweet potatoes. For sure. Uh, it's much sexier. Uh, Way um, sexier. So what is the, the consequence of going that route? Okay. It's a good question. So when you live in an insulin resistant state uh, for long periods of time, even if you're playing the carbohydrate avoidance game, let me, let me back up actually. There are plenty of studies to show that people who live in the insulin resistant state uh, end up with you know, their glucose values, even if they're stable right now, the glucose values begin creeping up over the course of time. So right now you can go to the doctor, you can get this thing called an A1C test and you can test normal, non-diabetic, fantastic. You return six months later, all of a sudden your number's creeping up just a little bit. And then you return six months after that and before you know it, you're like, huh, my number's still creeping up. What's going on? I'm not even eating carbohydrates. What's happening here, right? Hmm. So there's, there's a lot of research that actually shows that people who eat these low, uh, low carbohydrate, high fat diets, actually increase their risk for many chronic diseases, okay? So they can develop pre-diabetes and eventually type 2 diabetes. But even just, if they totally avoid carbs like the plague? Even if they totally avoid carbs like the plague. Okay, so the answer is, the answer is yes. And I, can, I actually just came across some research the other day that just that blew my mind. And what this research is showing is that there's a, there were 260 some odd people that went through a, a, ketose or a ketogenic diet for two years. And that's actually a pretty long time to be yeah. on a ketogenic diet because most I've, of the- I haven't seen any studies with uh, that long. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Most of the research is short. It's like 10 weeks or three months or something like yeah. that. So this paper came out in, in June of last year and they followed 262 people over the course of, of two years. And they were like, hey, take a look at the benefits of a ketogenic diet. So I went through and I scoured this paper from top to bottom because I'm genuinely curious. I want to know what's going to happen. And the results, um, the, the way that the paper was being communicated and the way that the paper was being talked about in the press was like, oh, look, a ketogenic diet reverses diabetes. A ketogenic diet uh, dramatically improves blood glucose control. And I was like, well, very interesting. Let me see. So when I went and took a look at the numbers, the numbers um, did not tell the same story at all. Okay, here's what the numbers showed. Uh, there's this thing called your, your A1C. Your A1C, for the people who don't know what that is, is basically just a marker of your average blood glucose over a three-month period. So what you're looking for is an A1C value that's less than 5.7%. 5.7 or less means that you're, you're free of diabetes. 5.7 to 6.4 means you're pre-diabetic. And 6.5 and above means that you have type 2 diabetes. Now, the people in this study started out with an A1C of 7.6%, okay? So 7.6% is basically considered uh, having type 2 diabetes. Then over the course of one year, their uh, A1C fell from, excuse me, it was 7.7%. It fell to 6.3%, uh, which is good, but still in the pre-diabetic range. And then after the, at the two-year marker, it went back up to 6.7%. So they're claiming that a ketogenic diet reversed diabetes, but the average A1C still shows that these people have type 2 diabetes. Okay. In addition to that, uh, fasting glucose concentrations started high at 163. After two years, they were 134. Anything greater than 125 indicates that you have type 2 diabetes. Yeah. A piece of evidence number two that these people are not actually reversing type 2 diabetes. Uh, piece of evidence number three, fasting insulin concentration started at 27, which is very high, and went all the way down to 16. 16 is still very insulin resistant. So their blood glucose shows type 2, their A1C shows type 2, their fasting insulin shows that they're pre-diabetic. Mm -hmm. Okay, Not, not awesome. Uh, in addition to that, you asked, you know, what are some of the consequences of eating a high-fat diet that maybe beyond, that extend beyond diabetes? Um, their total cholesterol went up went from 184 to 194. Their LDL concentration went from 103 to 114. Okay, mm -hmm. so they're, they're showing signs of increased cardiac risk. Right. Their HDL cholesterol went up a little bit, which is good, and their triglycerides came down, which is great. So, you know, but what about a plant-based keto? <laughs> what about a vegan keto? 
just if you could address that real quick, because I know that's still fat. Like I said, fat is super trendy still. And people are like avocados and coconut oil all the way. Exactly right. So if you eat a plant-based ketogenic diet, in fact, what you do is you eat nuts, seeds, avocados, coconut, olive oil, coconut oil, and uh, you know you minimize your carbohydrate intake at the same time. So if you are hell-bent on doing a ketogenic diet, please do a, a plant-based ketogenic diet. And the reason I say that is because um, uh, the nutrient density, the amount of vitamins, minerals, fiber, water, antioxidants, and phytochemicals that you can get from a plant-based ketogenic diet far exceeds what you can get from an animal-based ketogenic diet. And that's good. And not to mention the toxicities, the pathogens, the hormones, this, you know, yeah. So you're, yes. it's a good trade. It's a great trade. It's a great trade. But uh, people who eat ketogenic diets that are plant-based still are in what's considered the glucose intolerant state, meaning that here, here's the sort of like the thing that I want the, the world of diabetes to really understand or the world. I just want the world to understand this to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Just because your glucose is controlled and your glucose might be stable does not mean that the biology of your liver and muscle is in a healthy state. Okay. So just because your glucose is well controlled does not indicate that the biology of your liver, liver and the biology of your muscle is in a good, is, a, is in a, you know, a state that's, that's associated with a low risk for chronic disease. And what I mean by that is that when you're eating a high fat diet and you're playing the carbohydrate avoidance game, you can get good blood glucose values, which will happen on a plant-based ketogenic diet. But the minute you try and eat something carbohydrate rich, whether it's a potato or whether it's a fruit, your blood glucose is likely to go through the roof. Now, why would that be? Well, the reason is because your liver and muscle are still operating in that insulin resistant state. And you're in a ketogenic state, you're just never, you're literally never testing your muscle, you're never testing your liver to have to metabolize glucose. That'd be like you saying, hey, did you know I, you know, I'm a world champion, uh, I ran, I'm a world champion marathon runner. And I'd be like, really? I didn't know that, you know? Uh, are you faster than like the previous world champions? You're like, oh no, I, I don't know. I, I never test, but tr trust me, I'm the world champion, right? And I'd be like, what do you mean you never test? You're like, oh, I don't do competitions, right? I don't believe in competitions because what's the point of testing? I just trust me when I say that I'm the world champion, right? That's what people in the ketogenic philosophy are doing. They're saying, look, my, my blood glucose is stable. Therefore, just trust that they're going to be, my muscles and liver are in a good state, you know, for many years to come. But if you were to actually test them using a carbohydrate rich food, what you would find is that your glucose goes extremely high. And that right there tells a much more powerful story. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for clarifying that. And you know, you, you really are wonderful at going in depth, but not in a way that's like going to lose. I, I don't think we lost people, you know, okay. but you, but we went in great depth and I appreciate you for doing that. Cool. Um, nice. I've got some kind of questions that are still sticky in my mind that I, you know, they're, they're not, I, I, I'll correct myself. They're not that sticky, but I'm, I'm not that great personally at conveying and articulating myself around these topics. So maybe I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on fructose versus glucose as a fuel source. I know that fructose doesn't require insulin as a key to unlock, to get into the cell. Mm -hmm. um, so my thought is that fructose therefore is a great fuel source. You don't even need to rely on insulin, You're but on still, but still there's this holy cow fructose causes liver disease, fructose causes this and that, you know, watch out, you know? So yeah. Talk me through the fructose equation. Okay. This is, a, this is a great topic. So in the same way that there are two different general classes of carbohydrate rich food, there's the refined carbohydrate rich food and there's the whole carbohydrate rich food. There's also two different types or two different classes, I will call it, of, of how you find fructose in food. There's fructose from refined sources like high fructose corn syrup. And then there's fructose that comes in a mango. 
Okay. The fructose that comes in high fructose corn syrup is highly refined. But it's and still, I, people, and, and I, maybe you're going to get to this, and I'm sorry for interrupting, but people are, are like, oh, well, you know, high fructose corn syrup is like 50% fructose, I think. It's, um, a, it's about a 50 50 ratio. Exactly. And, and that's like about the same as a piece of fruit. Yeah, you're right. The ratio is not that important. Okay. The ratio is not important. The ratio is not that important because um, whether you're at like a 50 50 or a 55 45 or a 40 60, okay, fine. There's all water on the bridge. Like that's not necessarily what's going to determine how your liver and muscles react to it. What's going to determine how your liver and muscles react to it is how the fructose is packaged. If the fructose comes in the form of a refined sweetener, the, refu the fructose is basically exposed. What that means is that it doesn't have a protective cover on it. Okay, the protective cover comes from whole fruits and vegetables. Now, and are you kind of talking about fiber plus micronutrients plus vitamins, all these things? Like, is that what the protective cover is? Exactly right. So, think of a food as basically being a very complex three-dimensional structure, right? So have you ever seen a, uh, a what do you call it, an overpass on a highway being built? Oh, like with all the things going over each other, like yeah, in Los exactly. Angeles, just, yeah. Yeah, right. So you have like this very complicated overpass system, but have you ever seen an actual like overpass as it's being constructed, like in the middle of its construction phase? Oh, Maybe not. I mean, like with the steel beams and the rebarb and stuff. Bingo, you hit it on the head. Okay, so from, okay. from the outside, you look at it and you're like, oh, it's just a concrete. That's a bunch of concrete poles and it's got this concrete road on top of it. Okay, fine. It's just a bunch of concrete. But yeah. if you actually look deeper when they're constructing it, what you'll find is that it's actually not just a bunch of concrete. It's got a bunch of uh, steel, reinforced steel that acts as rebar. Okay, or the rebar is the reinforced steel that's on the inside that forms the structure. And then there's concrete poured inside of that in a very specific manner. And the concrete is basically attached to that rebar and that reinforces its strength and makes it seismically, you know, uh, safe. In the same way, when you eat a food, you have basically rebar inside of the food that you're eating. And the rebar comes in the form of fiber. Okay, so if I eat a banana, I'm not just getting a whole giant boat of you know, glucose and fructose. No, it's not that simple. You actually have a whole giant, you're eating a three-dimensional matrix of rebar, and then inside of that rebar or the fiber, you have lots of vitamins, minerals, you've got uh, antioxidants, you've got water, and you've got phytochemicals. These phytochemicals are like chemicals that come from plants that are known to have very potent anti uh, and, uh, disease reducing properties. Okay, so you have this rebar on the outside plus all of these micronutrients plus glucose. You're right, they got carbohydrates, you got protein, you got fat, and it's this very complex molecule. So when you put it into your mouth and you chew it and it goes into your stomach and then it goes into your small intestine, it takes a little bit of effort for the, di for the enzymes in your digestive system and your small intestine to like pick apart all of the material that, that they're designed to pick apart. And, and to separate out the carbohydrate from the fat, from the protein, from the vitamins and minerals. And as a result of that, that process takes time and that's okay. It takes time. The fiber slows down the rate at which this absorption is happening. And as, as a result of that, the glucose, which is present inside of your banana, doesn't actually hit your blood that quickly. It's kind of like a slow rise and then like a slow fall. And it gives you a much more a normal blood glucose response to a meal, as opposed to having a, a beverage like a sugar sweetened beverage that has high fructose corn syrup in it. That high fructose corn syrup doesn't have fiber, doesn't have vitamins, minerals. It doesn't have protective antioxidants. It doesn't have protective phytochemicals. So when that high fructose corn syrup hits your tongue and then eventually gets into your small intestine, it's absorbed within within minutes gets inside of your blood, and then all of a sudden now you have a very high fructose, very high glucose concentration in your blood, and the speed at which the glucose and fructose get inside of your blood absolutely matters. The whole food slows down the absorption rate. The refined food speeds up the absorption rate. So if you were a liver or you were a muscle and you're just hanging out, just waiting for something to happen, then all of a sudden the person that you're in drinks a soda 
what you would experience within the first five to 10 minutes is you would just get hit with this glucose or like with this influx of glucose and hit with an influx of fructose. And as a result of that, you would be forced to have to take a bunch of it up and do something and then try and salvage as much as you possibly could. Versus if you were in, you know, you were in the same person who ate a potato, you would see a much more normal rise of glucose and a much slower rise of fructose. And as a result of that, both of these can be absorbed properly and used for energy. Mm -hmm. now, the last thing I'll say is that you're absolutely right. Like glucose, once it enters a cell, goes through this process known as glycolysis. So glucose enters a cell and then glycolysis is just a, a pathway that's got a number of different uh, enzymes that are converting glucose to glucose 6 phosphate to another molecule to another molecule to another molecule. You're so going to give me chain. PTSD. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, I, I love this stuff, but I know some people are like, oh gosh. <laughs> yeah, it just becomes overwhelming. But the idea yeah. here is that think of glycolysis as basically being a series of dominoes, right? You tip yeah. the first domino and then it hits the next one, next one, next one, next one, next one. Eventually, at the very end, you have this thing called ATP. You, you take the glucose, you burn it in a mitochondria, and you get some ATP out of it. Okay, and that's the, that's the end result. Now, along this pathway, which you know, I guess you could view as being basically a linear pathway, you have a side entrance, and the side entrance is this thing called fructose. Mm -hmm. So fructose can come in a side door and get into this series of dominoes, but it just doesn't do it from the start. And as a result of that, because fructose has an ability to get inside from the side, uh, it can basically be absorbed um, without the requirement for insulin. And that's a good thing, actually, because fructose, when it comes in a protected state from a whole food, is actually a fuel source. It gets inside the glycolytic pathway, and then it, it contributes to the production of ATP, right? But if it's in an unexposed, I'm sorry, if it's in an exposed state and you're eating a refined uh, carbohydrate or a refined sugar-sweetened beverage, then the overload of fructose can trigger a number of intracellular mechanisms that increase the deposition of fat, it can increase the conversion to fat, and it can make your liver very inflamed which can then increase your risk for many, you know, abnormalities, including fatty liver disease and beyond. I could geek out with you all day. I, I really could. And I still have, you know, bubbling up things that I would love your perspective on, but maybe we should evolve this conversation into mastering diabetes and the incredible stuff that, that you and Robbie are doing. Um, in the program, and I'm really excited to learn about what's packed into this book that is, uh, when is it going to be released? It's going to be released on February 18th. Uh, All right. Weeks from now. So around the time that this goes live, we'll have the Mastering Diabetes book. So, you, you know, taking this conversation into that, like you, you, your work is really geared towards public education, supporting people. I know with type one, 1 1.5 too, we didn't even really get into like what the deal is with 1.5, our yeah. current understanding. Um, but I'm sure people out there, well, maybe like what is 1.5 real quick? All right. I'll give you my 30 second synopsis. Yeah. Uh, type one diabetes generally affects uh, people under the age of 30. So it's an autoimmune version of diabetes that in which your immune system kills off your own beta cells that are responsible for secreting insulin. That's what I have. That's what Robbie has. That's what generally occurs in young individuals. Now, insulin a, dependent is other otherwise. Insulin said. dependent. That's exactly right. And because that means that your ability to produce your own insulin has diminished over time. And um, most people with type 1 diabetes eventually get to a point where they're producing effectively zero insulin. So they have to inject it via syringe or via insulin pump. Uh, type 1.5 diabetes is, is an adult onset slow progressing version of type 1 diabetes that affects adults gr generally greater than the age of about 30. So you're, you're older than 30, you develop autoimmune diabetes, and usually at an older age, it's like a, it's a slower progression. So it's like a, the strength of the autoimmune condition is a little bit less, and as a result of that, the, the time it takes to get to full insulin dependence is much longer. In people with type 1, it can be a year. In people with type 1.5, it can be two years, five years, 10 years. They may never get there. Any experience, yeah, any experience reversing 1.5? Good question. The answer yeah. is no. The answer yeah. is no. We don't have any experience in reversing type 1.5. Uh, 
And the reason is because it's autoimmune. We, to this day, don't know, the scientific community does not know how to reverse autoimmune diabetes, whether type 1 or 1.5. But I'm a firm believer that in the next, I don't know, call it 10, maybe 20 years, type 1 and 1.5 diabetes will, I'm pretty sure, be eradicated. I don't think there will be conditions anymore. I think there will wow, be some type wow. of, yeah, I think there will be some type of a stem cell therapy or some type of, a, you know, a surgical intervention, which will just like fix the problem and restore insulin production. But that's just, that's just my guess. Wow. That's pretty cool. So anyways, and then type two is kind of the adult onset, non-insulin dependent. Correct. Just uh, the cake, the cake diabetes, <laughs> but which is really <laughs> like, which is really, you know, a- after learning and hearing what you said so so in depthly um it's the the fat diabetes it's a saturated fat diabetes that's a good way i've never thought about it that way it's saturated fat diabetes yes i like that okay you can you can borrow it okay (laughs) so anyways so um this this book obviously i don't have a copy i know you do you can flash it it's it's beautiful i have seen the cover Boom, boom, boom. Mm-hmm. Mastering Diabetes, you and, and Robbie co-authored it? That's right. We co-authored it. It took us about two and a half years to put the whole thing together. Awesome. And- so give me, you know, give me not the cliff notes. I don't want you to give it away, but like what is packed into there? Is it kind of like a, a guide to, is it designed to be a guide to support people in DIY reversing di- diabetes or, what, or what's the deal? That's a good question. Okay. So think of... Uh, the book basically has three parts to it. Uh, the first part is uh, Robbie and I sort of explaining our own personal stories and talking about what happened to us um, along the way. So Robbie also has type one diabetes. He's got a slightly different story than mine, but he eventually came to a plant-based diet uh, just through many years of evolution. And um, the two of us ended up learning from the same uh, instructor, Doug Grant. And is, okay. is that guy, is that how you guys met? What's your, yeah. Yeah, exactly how we met each other. Exactly. Okay. So the first part is about our stories. The second part is about the biology of diabetes that your doctor never told you. Okay. The biology of diabetes that your doctor doesn't even know. And full disclosure, we love doctors. We absolutely, we have nothing but good things to say about doctors. So this is not meant to be like us pointing a finger and saying, oh, doctors are bad. Doctors are dumb. And it's not like that. It's just that they were never trained in medical school to, to talk about food and nutrition. And it goes into a little bit of detail about you know why that's the case, but then in addition to that, it teaches you the biology that we just described and goes into more detail about it as well. And then the third part of the book is uh, an exploration of what you can do. It literally is a program. It's the DIY program that says, literally, just do this. It's a step-by-step program that takes you all the way from day zero all the way through you know six, eight weeks of changing your diet slowly, 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 slowly to get to a point where you're eating a diet that's mostly plant-based or hopefully fully plant-based. And by doing so, you will see dramatic improvements in your overall health and your insulin sensitivity. And we recommend, you know, following the instructions in this book as close to the way we describe them as possible. And when you do that, we've, I don't know if we've ever seen anybody who truly follows the mastering diabetes method, not get some tremendous benefits. That's awesome. I was just, you know, it just popped into my mind. I hope that you guys go out of business. I hope that there is no more diabetes. And, and I, I think that, I mean, obviously you're not going to like go out, like go out of business. What does that even mean? But, um, right. Like, yeah, like I, I really do see that, you know, obviously there are millions, I don't know what the current statistics are now, but I'm sure you do like how many million people have prediabetes or diabetes? Is it like a third of the population or something? Yeah, the statistics are gross. 30 million people have diagnosed diabetes, both type one and type two. So 30 million diagnosed, 85 million undiagnosed prediabetes. Wow. So the combination is like 110, 115 million people, which is one out of every three people. Any nice sense? So they're all going to buy your book. They're all, I hope they're- so. They're all going to get in, take responsibility, be empowered to reverse their disease. You're going to go out of business and live on the beach and eat your mangoes. And like, what, are, what is your plan after there's no diabetes? Have you ever like considered like 
once your mission is accomplished, mm-hmm. um, like what's next for you, Cyrus? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think my wife and I want to start a farm. We want to, <laughs> we want to start a, a, a farm with a bunch of animals, but not like, you know, to, not to eat the animals. No milking, no milking and no cheese milking. making. We would love to have <clears throat> cats, dogs. We'd love a goat. We'd love a duck. We'd love some monkeys and, you know, get a plot of land and raise a whole bunch of animals and maybe have a bunch of mango trees in the background and, um, you know, live the life. And so maybe that'll unfold one day. And I mean, you're right. I've actually thought about this a lot too, where, you know, sometimes people come to us and they're like, Hey, thanks for all your help. Like, I don't have diabetes anymore. I don't need you anymore. And I'm like, (laughs) did I just put myself out of business? Like, this is a terrible business model. Right. (laughs) But, uh, you know, the truth is that there's so many people that need the help. And, you know, when we, we get these testimonials just like left and right from like multiple testimonials per day from people that are just for the first time in their entire life, they're able to lose weight and keep it off for the first time in their entire life. They're able to reduce their blood pressure using no medication and uh, you know, get off of diabetes medication and actually live with a lot of energy. And when I read these testimonials, I'm just like, I'm like, that's the reason that right there is my lifeblood. That's why we do what we do. Beautiful. Beautiful. Love it. I'm, I'm on board and that's, that's, that's why we do what we do. Well, you know, on that note, any kind of last words of wisdom, last remarks to kind of fuel, ignite a little passion, light a little spark for someone who's maybe got diagnosed or undiagnosed diabetes, maybe struggling with eating habits, behaviors, patterns. Yeah. Get them going. Okay. Here's what I would say. I'd say, if you are at risk for living with diabetes, which again is a, is a large number of people, or if you've already been diagnosed with any form of diabetes, please open your mind to the idea that diabetes is much more complex than simply a game of carbohydrate avoidance. If you are playing the carbohydrate avoidance game or you're trying to minimize your carbohydrate intake, it may be controlling your blood glucose, but your health as an individual is much, much larger than what you will ever see on your blood glucose meter. So I definitely want your glucose control. There's no question about it. But I want you to think about not only your short-term blood glucose control, I want you to think about your long-term chronic disease risk. And if you can find a way to eat that maximizes your blood glucose control today and reduces your chronic disease risk into the future, that's the gold standard. That's the power of a plant-based diet. We know this from plenty of research, and if you want to put this into play in your life, it can fundamentally change not only the biology of your liver and muscle, it can change the way you think, it can change the way you feel, it can change your energy levels, it can literally change you from the inside out. Give it a shot, try it out, and I think you're going to be very pleasantly surprised. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Love it. Um, Yeah, and you know whole food plant-based, right? Like I think that plant-based as this becomes more of a popular thing, it's like people are just throwing around plant-based, plant-based burgers, plant-based this, plant-based that, but um, focusing on that real whole intact natural food. You're absolutely right. No yeah. question. About it. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the, uh, the clarification because processed plant-based yeah. is not the way to go. Yeah. Well, Cyrus, I really do appreciate your knowledge, your wisdom, your depth in which you share from and your experience. And I'm excited to uh, point people towards this incredible book starting February 18th. Um, And I'm excited to read it myself. Thank you, sir. Uh, We'll be sure to send you a copy, no question. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. So thanks thanks for having me. All right. Well, peace and love. And until next time. All right.